right. Well, good morning again. What do you do uh, to remember things? Uh, what do you do to help you to keep something on your mind that you have to do or uh, an event that you need to uh, take part of or something that's on your schedule um, or birthdays or other celebrations? What do you do to help yourself remember? I have... Um, Growing up, I've been, I, I, when I was a kid, I've gotten better, but when I was a kid, I was sort of known for being fairly forgetful. My mom would tell me to do things, um, and I, I think that she thought it was an excuse. Like, like when I would say, oh, I forgot to do that, like I legitimately did not remember. I, I just would forget things all the time, uh, and I always got in trouble for that, uh, not unloading the dishwasher or something that I was supposed to do while she was at work, and uh, I would forget things. And I've had to, as I've gotten older, learn how to find ways to remember things. Often when I meet somebody, uh, I want to try to remember their name, uh, but quite often if somebody tells me their name on, the, on first meeting them, uh, if I don't say their name back to them in the next sentence, uh, by the time we've, we've uh, had a, another sentence or two, I literally have no idea what their name is. And so uh, if I meet you and you find that I say your name back to you right away, uh, now you know why. I'm trying to ingrain that in myself so that that I will remember your name because I care. I want to know what your name is. I just have a bad memory sometimes. Um, what do you do? Do you write things down? Uh, do you leave yourself notes? Do you write something on the mirror? I have several post-it notes and note cards sitting on my desk of uh, things, scriptures and quotes and things that I want to keep on my mind. Um, we have all kinds of ways. Maybe you put things in your phone. You tell Siri uh, or Alexa to remind you of something along the way. How do you remember? I have been working on doing uh, memory verses, trying to memorize certain scriptures. And I uh, have, uh, you've probably, you may, maybe you've seen that have these uh, bracelets that I wear that have uh, the first letter of each word in the scripture that I'm working on that week. Um, and I, I wear those around. I don't have it on right now, but I wear those around to remind myself of those verses. And of course, some things are more important to remember. Some things are trivial if we forget them or not. But some things, if we forget, if we lose sight of some things, they are detrimental to our well-being. Uh, we can forget our very identity, maybe not our name, but we can forget in a way who we are if we aren't keeping our eye on certain things. And we can start to drift away from what is at the core of us if we are forgetful in that sense. Maybe that's why in the Bible... Um, something is said about remembering something or not forgetting something more than 300 times throughout Scripture. We are told to remember. One example, when the Israelites were preparing to finally enter into the promised land, uh, after they had wandered in the wilderness for so long, and Moses gave a series of speeches and uh, gave them reminders about who they are and what God had called them to. Um, that, that series of speeches and reminders is what we call the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, he says this, Only take care as you go into the promised land. Take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. Unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. He says, make them known to your children and to your children's children. He says, don't forget what you've seen God do. Don't forget, tell your children and tell your grandchildren, pass it down, and you see how he's establishing kind of a generational system of remembrance because God knows our forgetfulness. He knows that we forget things. And so he blesses us with certain, what I'm going to call, sacred experiences that fortify our memories. God blesses us with sacred experiences that fortify our memories, and there are a number of them. When we look back at the history of Israel, we see there are times where uh, they do something like stacking up stones, or, or as we sing in the song, to raise an Ebenezer. Um, and they do these things in, in commemoration of something that God has done on that spot. So that their children will come by and ask, what are those stones all about? 
and they can retell the story. And it is something to remember. And God commanded certain feasts and festivals to be celebrated by the Israelites to remember the things that God had done. Notably, there was the Passover celebration. There was also the Feast of of Weeks. Uh, We know it as Pentecost. There's the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths where they lived in tents to remember um, their ancestors wandering and living in tents. We have the blessing of baptism, that God calls us when we are brought into the family of God, when we leave behind our old ways and receive forgiveness of our sins and choose to dedicate our lives to following Jesus, we have the sacred experience of baptism, where we are immersed into Christ and we can look back into, at, that, at that point and say, that was the turning point. That was the moment where my life split off into a totally different path where I was following Christ and given the gift of the Spirit and saved out of this world. And so we have the experience of baptism. We also have this weekly rhythm of gathering together as a family, as the church. We have this gathering that refocuses, refocuses us each week on Jesus. And our focus today is one of those sacred experiences that we call communion, or the Lord's Supper, or in some circles, the Eucharist. Um, it is this sacred experience that is at the heart of our gatherings. And it is what we want to focus on today because it was given to us to call to mind, to help us to remember the very thing that we celebrate at Easter. The story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Um, Communion is more than merely retelling the facts of the story. We could do that without the symbols, right? We could do that without the bread and the wine. We could do it without that. We can just talk about it. But instead, it is, a, it is an experience. It is something that is tangible, that is physical, that we, um, that we go through, that we participate in. And it connects us in our mind and connects us in our body to the original event that it commemorates. It draws us back there. It is both a personal time of reflection and connection with our God, and it is a communal time where we share in this thing together. Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church, he recounts the uh, initiation of this sacred experience, of this communion. And he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, he says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When he says, do this in remembrance of me, it is a word uh, that does mean a, an experiential type of remembrance. It is not just like calling to mind a fact that you know. It is a participation in that memory. It is experiential remembrance. And he talks about the bread that is his body, the cup that is his blood. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. It's interesting to consider the fact that in establishing this, and as we do this week after week, uh, we are called to remember something that we weren't actually there for. It's an interesting thing to consider. Remember something that you weren't actually there for. Have you ever been in a group of friends, that uh, mutual friends, and they start telling stories, and uh, as they tell the story and they're laughing about this thing that happened, you realize, wait a second, I wasn't there 
for that occasion. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But as they continue telling the story over and over again, you start to feel like maybe you were there, right? But somehow we are called to remember something that we weren't actually there for. How do we do that? How can I remember something when I wasn't there? Well, that's part of the blessing of these um, remembrance practices. That's part of the blessing of these, ex- these sacred experiences like communion. Because when we partake, when we partake in that moment, it connects us directly with Jesus himself in a mysterious way. A way that I, I can't articulate or totally unpack, but Jesus says, this is my body. He says, this is my blood. This is him in some mysterious way, and we are connecting with it. It's an amazing thing to consider. Paul says, again to the Corinthians a little earlier on, in chapter 10, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You see the unity of the church kind of uh, described in the context of taking of this bread. But he uses the term participation. It's a word we've talked about a number of times before. The word is koinonia, uh, often translated as fellowship. Um, it is an is a interweaving uh, of, of people, of relational connections. Koinonia. And somehow when we take the bread, when we take the cup, it is a koinonia, a fellowship with Jesus himself. It is sharing in his life together with him and it brings about unity with Christ and unity among us in Christ. I think it's powerful for several reasons, but one of them is the that it's power to, to take us back there. Like to take us back to that very room in some ways where Jesus established this, uh, this, this um, sacred experience. It takes us back to that, that upper room where he shared that with his disciples. It takes us back to the foot of the cross to remember, to be there in that moment, to see Jesus, his body, given for you has the power to take us back there. And so when I say, how do we remember something that we weren't there for? In communion, in a way, in fact, we were there. In fact, we are there when we take it. As I said a moment ago, in many ways, communion really is the centerpiece of our time together. And often it may not feel that way. And that's maybe a a challenge to us to uh, to, to consider it the centerpiece of what we are doing. I mean, in other parts of our time together, we, we talk about Jesus. We believe in his presence among us wherever two or three are gathered in his name. We sing and we, we pray to the Lord. But in this, in this moment, he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And in this sacred experience, we... We touch him, his body, in our hands. We bring him into ourselves in this mysterious way. We don't just tell the story. We remember it. We connect with it. We participate in the story. And that story, because we are a part of it, we have koinonia in that story, has a real impact on our lives. It changes us fundamentally from our core. We are a part of the story of Jesus. It changes us here and now. Um, I brought with me some visuals, visual symbols. Uh, this is not unleavened bread. Okay, this is from Panera. Uh, I looked around. I looked around for uh, some of the um, some of the the matzah that we used to use, and we just don't have any around anymore. Um, we've moved to to other 
types of things that we use. Uh, so this is just, use your imagination that this is unleavened bread, okay? Uh, but Jesus took, took bread, and he gave thanks for it to the Father. And when he broke it, he said, this is my body, given for you. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Participate, connect, go back, fellowship with Jesus. When he did this, when he broke this in front of them, and he said, this is my body, they did not understand what he meant by that. They didn't understand in that moment. They, they were probably looking at, at each other going, this is another one of those times, isn't it? When we'll have to figure this out later. We'll talk about this afterwards, is what they said to each other, I'm sure. They didn't understand. They didn't understand what was about to happen. Um, that that very night, Jesus was going to be arrested. And by the very next afternoon, his executed dead body would be hanging on a cross not far from there. That they would all be looking at they would all be looking at the one that they thought was the Messiah, thought was going to lead them to something greater and better and yet he's gone. What does this mean now? They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't understand what, what it was all about. But we have come to understand through the teachings that arose afterwards and, and what, what all happened in, in the teachings of the New Testament, we have come to understand that because he gave his body, we are freed from the grip of sin on our bodies. And we are united in a body of believers. Because he gave his body, we are what we are in this body. Uh, this year's theme for our church is we are the body. That's our theme for the year in thinking about our connections, our, our fellowship and growing uh, in our koinonia, in our uh, interweaving of our lives. We've been talking about recently what it means to be the church. The church that, that God uh, empowers and has established. And we recognize it is only possible for us to be the church because of the body of Jesus. We can only be the body of Christ because of the literal, actual body of Jesus at the cross. Sin has a way of um, driving wedges between all sorts of relationships. That's what sin does. Sin separates us. It breaks us. It tears us apart. Uh, apart from God and apart from one another. But at the cross... The power of sin is defeated. At the cross, it is overcome and we are healed. We are restored. We are brought into a relationship of shalom. Isaiah 53 describes Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. It's amazing to me when I read this and the rest of that chapter, um, as Lyle read for us last week. Um, it's amazing to me how this describes Jesus around 700 years before he was born. 700 years before a baby was in a manger, Isaiah was prophesying about that man on the cross. Amazing. Incredible. Um, and yet, here it is, telling the gospel story, the story that became our story too, the story that we participate in that we are baptized into, we join him in his death and burial and in his resurrection when we are baptized. Paul said to the Romans, Romans 6, 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Our old selves, our sinful selves went to the cross 
with Jesus. And so when we celebrate, when we remember his death, we remember the death of our old selves right there with him. And knowing that because of that, we have been freed, we have been liberated from the bondage of sin, transformed from that sinful old self into a glorious saint before God, and welcomed into the community of saints, the body of Christ. And so when we, when we take communion here in a few minutes, um, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll share in that, um, that sacred experience. You will hold in your hands the unleavened bread. And recognize that as you hold that, as you prepare to take that in a few minutes, that it is more than meets the eye. That somehow, it is the body of Christ. The sinless pure body of Christ. And as you partake it, as you take it into yourself, recognize that the body, the sinless, pure body of Christ becomes part of your body. It gets taken in and absorbed in your body and remember his sinlessness, the unleavened nature of Christ becomes your nature. He gives you his sinlessness in his grace. And as you do that, we do that together, and you are now one with the body. And we'll do that in a few minutes as we partake of the cup, of the bread. Because of his body, we are freed from the grip of sin, and our, uh, we are united in a body of believers. And then Jesus took a cup. A cup. And he gave thanks for that, too. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And again, as he holds that cup and he says this, I am sure they didn't understand what he meant. They might have had some inclinations of part of what he meant. But the truth would become clear in time. I think it helps to understand that um, it's, it's almost certainly that this, this was part of a Passover meal that they were sharing. And in the Passover meal, there are four cups, or they drink from the cup four times, uh, signifying different promises of God in the story of the Exodus. Um, and this is thought to be the third of the four cups, which is known as the cup of blessing which stands for God's promise to redeem his people. And Jesus says, if that's the case, as he picks up the cup of blessing and that represents God's promise to redeem his people, and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And we see, we see that because he gave his blood, we are redeemed. We are forgiven. We are brought given. We are brought into the very household of God. The blood of Jesus does something that is strange for blood. It cleanses rather than stains. I remember when I was um, seven or eight and I was riding my bike um, recklessly outside and uh, hit something and flew over the handlebars and hit my forehead on the sidewalk. Uh, I was about just down the street from my house, but I walked down the sidewalk with blood running down my face and dripping a trail all the way back to my house. Um, I went to the back door and my mother opened the door and screamed because, <laughs> because I was just covered in blood. And here's, here's the thing that stands out to me. She would not let me inside the house. I laid down, I literally laid down in the driveway while they cleaned up, cleaned up my wounds. And it wasn't as bad as it looked. Uh, just a lot, of, a lot of blood was flowing out. But it stands out in my mind. I wasn't allowed in the house because blood stains. My mom didn't want stains on the couch or on the carpet of blood if she could avoid it. 
But strangely, the blood of Jesus does the exact opposite. It removes stains, the stains of sin and our mistakes. It washes us. It forgives us. It redeems us. It purifies us. You see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I just see this and I just read the overwhelming generosity of God. Undeserving as we are, Jesus pays the ultimate price. This is redemption. He pays, pays for you. He purchases you with his own blood. But when I say he purchases you, it's not like, uh, the, like would have been common t- at the practice at the time to go to the market and to purchase a person to be your slave. That was not what he meant. We are purchased not as slaves in that sense. We are adopted as sons and daughters into the very family of God. We are in his household. Colossians 1.19. And if you are serving communion, uh, go ahead and get ready to serve that. Uh, In Colossians 1.19, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or on earth, or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Making peace, making shalom, making right relationship by the blood of his cross. In just a moment, um, we're going to take communion. And uh, after, after the bread, uh, after you hold the bread in your hand, the body of Christ, and you take that into yourself, after that, you will also drink from the cup, the cup of blessing, the blood given for your own redemption. We participate in it. We fellowship with the blood of Jesus himself, blood shed on the cross to forgive us, but blood that now flows through the veins of this body of Christ, uniting us together, making us family. And so... Because he gave his body, we're freed from the grip of sin, united into a body of believers, and because he gave his blood, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, and called his children. Let's remember, and let's fellowship. The body and the blood. Crucifixion is a shockingly gruesome event. Um, it, is, uh, it seems an odd thing to celebrate, an odd thing to commemorate on the surface, something so gruesome. And if it were the end of Jesus' story, it would be little more than a tragic tale of a good man who caught the wrong kind of attention from evil men in power. And we might have heard his story, and we might have thought, isn't that sad? Didn't he have some interesting teachings? More than likely, we would have never heard of him. Like many others who we've never heard of. And the crucifixion wouldn't be something to commemorate, much less to celebrate. But that event, that gruesome, terrible event, is given wonderful meaning by what happened next. And we praise God that what we just remembered isn't the end of the story of Jesus. Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. 
And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen. As he said, come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Amazing, astounding moment in history. What Jesus' enemies believed was his defeat was in fact his moment of victory. The grave could not hold him. As we sang before the sermon, death could not keep his prey. He tore the bars away. And when he emerged from the realm of the dead, he proved once and for all that he really is the Messiah. He really is the king of all things. And so, because he gave his body, we're freed from the grip of sin. Because he gave his blood, we are redeemed and forgiven and brought into God's household. And because he lives, we can have confidence in his reign. And we share in the hope of resurrection. Because he rose, because death itself was defeated, we know that the sacrifice of his body, the sacrifice of his blood, was accepted. It was acceptable to God. It was effective for accomplishing what we need it to accomplish. It is endorsed by the fact that he rose. And we know that this isn't about merely remembering something that happened a long time ago, but rejoicing in the power of the still reigning king. The one who sits on the throne even now as we talk about him. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Have confidence. That is to say, there is a throne to draw near to. And there is mercy and grace to be given at that throne. And we praise God for that. Um, Often, it seems, uh, funerals, uh, often families like to refer to those um, not as funerals, but as celebrations of life. Uh, which is a good, good re- redirection of our thoughts. But often what we are doing is celebrating the life that has been lived, remembering, remembering what they did in the past tense. As we celebrate Jesus, we, we do some of that, but we also celebrate the life that he has now, that he rose from the grave and we have a different kind of celebration of life. It is a life that we are invited to join in and to have that life for ourselves as well, his life gives us life now and eternally. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we certainly shall be united with him in a resurrection like his. Could there be anything more glorious to celebrate? Is there anything of greater, worth greater praise than that? To recognize that we share in a resurrection like his. These bodies of ours, like everything else in this world, won't last for long. Many of us probably already feeling, feeling them giving out on us in various ways. They won't last for long. But we rejoice that when these bodies pass away, it's not the end of our story either. It's not the end of our story either. We will live in the presence of our God, and we will rise again when he returns. Every Sunday that we are together, 
Every Sunday that we commune with the body and the blood of Christ, we are reorienting ourselves and reorienting each other, and we are shining the light out into this world to reorient towards these truths. To go back to 1 Corinthians again, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death. You shout it from the rooftops, the glory of his death and resurrection. And so the final point is just this. As we share the sacred remembrance of communion, we celebrate and we proclaim what he has accomplished. What he has accomplished. As he hung on the cross, John tells us that he said, it is finished. The stamp of completion. It is finished. Also, as he hung on the cross, he exclaimed at one point, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the first line of Psalm 22. And I believe he had that entire psalm on his mind. Because if you read through that psalm, it describes the crucifixion in amazing detail. It's incredible. It's a powerful psalm that points to the cross even longer before Isaiah, before Jesus. And that psalm concludes like this. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Incredible. This was on Jesus' mind. He has done it. It is finished. Jesus gave his life to open the way for us to be united with him. He rose from the grave to take his seat on his throne where he sits to this day. And I know he lives because the Bible tells me, but even beyond that, because I experience his presence. He is among us. We, in communion, hold his body in our hands. We take the blood of the covenant into ourselves. And because he lives, I live. And will continue to live into eternity with him. In just a moment, um, I'll be at the back of the room with the elders, and we are there for you. Uh, if you are ready to commit yourself to, to Christ, to go through the sacred experience of baptism, to be united with him in that water, uh, joining your story with his death, burial, and resurrection to walk in newness of life. We'd love to do that with you today. Uh, if you need prayers or you want to study or you just want to talk, uh, that's what we'll be there for. And we'll be back there during, as we sing the next song um, after we read this final passage from Isaiah 25, and this will conclude us. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people uh, he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. If we can help you today.